Hello and welcome. India's manufacturing future may be bright, but the bright also depends on the level of indigenization and local innovation that happens, particularly in technology-led engineering. To talk about this and some interesting stories in that context is uh, Kannan Lakshmi Narayan, founder and CTO of Vortex Engineering Limited, uh, based out of Chennai. Kannan, thank you very much for uh, speaking to us. My pleasure. So, uh, you created some very interesting companies. One is a uh, ATM uh, mach making a machine, uh, which is also economical ATM machines. It's all the, you also built a textile machinery company, and you've also built a, uh, a third company, which you've not told me about. Yeah, the third company is into uh, technology solutions for skill training. Okay. We make simulators based uh, skill training tools. Right. So let's talk about uh, the first two, right? And 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 I and this whole thing springs from your thinking that uh, technology or uh, engineering has to be localized or has to be bottom up, right? So tell us about the ATM story. What made you think of making an ATM against so many multinationals who all make ATMs uh, aimed at countries like us? Well, it's not that we went out trying to compete with the multinationals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we, we were trying to address the problem of financial inclusion, a mm -hmm. uh, context where 80% of people in rural India are not having a bank account. Right. And uh, when we looked at what is it that you can do to bring them within the fold because they obviously need so many financial services, mm. uh, it appeared to us that you need a solution that makes it profitable for a bank to deliver those services. Mm. And when we looked at the different challenges that a bank would typically face. Mm. We recognize that an ATM machine is the way to go, mm. but a conventional ATM will not suit such a context mm. for a number of technical reasons. Mm. So we drew up a s sort of wish list of what should an ATM for these people be like, mm. and uh, then went about building it. Mm. So this was targeted at India, particularly tier two, tier three towns, rural areas, mm. and uh, meant to operate in wide variety of ambient conditions with low energy in context where you have fluctuating power or no power mm. and where the quality of currency can be very widely varying. Mm. Nobody carries a wallet, they all mm. bundle it in their <laughs> um, <laughs> clothes. And these are the kind of currency that you must reliably be able to dispense. Right. So how, uh, how much, what would your cost be of your ATM versus let's say a similar, uh, not a similar, but let's say a, the normal ATM one would see in cities? I think our cost is about 30% lower than a conventional uh, okay. ATM, mm. but more importantly, the cost of ownership, mm. if you take a five to seven year period, mm. is significantly lower because of low maintenance, mm. low power consumption, and a number of other factors. Mm -hmm. So what are the two or three critical areas that you had to differentiate when you were building your ATM or do differently, uh, I'm assuming on the in engineering side? So the core engine is what we built di differently, mm. which is the cash dispenser, mm. uh, how it picks the currency and dispenses it. Mm. And uh, really the challenge we were trying to attack mm. was that when we started our work, the industry benchmark was that a dispenser would uh, consume close to a thousand watts. Mm -hmm. And to me, it looked um, unacceptable because we all count notes. So in mm. that sense, you are a cash dispenser <laughs> and so am I. Mm. And we do it with our fingers, which probably consume three, four watts. Mm. They can't, a finger cannot generate more power than mm. that. So why is an engineered machine so much more wasteful of energy? Mm. And the reason we were so concerned about energy is not merely because we want to pay a smaller tariff at the end of the month, mm. uh, but because in most of the places where we were seeking to deploy, energy is just not there. Right. And then to make backup power affordable and uh, ensure what is called uptime availability. Mm. You can't tell somebody there's no power Mm. come and try your luck after two days when mm. they need the money desperately. Mm. So this is the reason we were very, very mindful of the energy. And uh, this meant that we had to completely re-engineer mm. the core uh, mechanism of uh, cash dispensing. Mm. So can you in layman's language explain what is the difference? I mean, uh, how is it closer to like using my hands versus what conventional machines use? I think in a, uh, the good thing is that when we started designing the thing, we had no idea how a conventional ATM was built. Okay. So, so you didn't uh, take one and strip it down? and No, so we okay. modeled it after how we would count. Because for mm. me, uh, being biased by the conventional design mm. meant that maybe I'll be 20% lower than 1000 watt, but that's not acceptable. Right. Uh, I wanted to start with uh, the way we count notes mm. as the benchmark. Mm. And uh, we used uh, mere gravity. Mm which is a free source of energy uh, to great advantage. Mm. And um, uh, at every little step, we just try to see how uh, any superfluous usage of energy is avoided. Mm -hmm. For instance, in a conventional ATM, uh, 
every piece of currency is conveyed over a long distance, two, mm. three meters, mm. before it reaches the final destination. Mm. And one by one, these uh, pieces are assembled mm. before they come to you as a bunch. Mm. And uh, in one architecture of our product, we just pick all of them one after the other mm. and put them all in one cartridge mm. and then convey the cartridge, which is yeah. a lot more efficient than conveying things one by one. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of things that we have done in detail. We have about um, uh, eight patents mm. uh, on different aspects of this. Mm. And uh, we really brought down uh, our ATM consumes a peak power of 50 watt, mm -hmm. uh, which is inclusive of the screen and other things. Mm -hmm. And would you say that's the most differentiating aspect in your ATM, apart from the cost and everything else? Uh, the other important thing is that uh, even with urban ATMs, we all have the experience that when we go, they say the ATM is down. Mm. And uh, very soon, the maintenance team will come in a uh, armored van. <laughs> armored van or something and they will yeah. strip open the whole thing, clear whatever is the problem and then go away. Mm. Now this turnaround time which would be a few hours in a city, mm. uh, if the ATM were located in a distant remote location, mm. would take several days. Correct. So uh, that we cannot afford. So we had to build a dispenser that's a lot more reliable mm. and can also handle very wide variation in the quality of currency. Mm. In the cities, typically what is called bank chests, mm. they issue the currency of a certain uh, a certain grade, yeah. what is called ATM fit currency, which is mm. very crisp. good. Yeah. yeah, which is very good currency. Yeah. Uh, but in uh, the kind of places that I am talking about, the people come to the counter and give deposits to the counter clerk and all of this is stacked, it is ironed out, uncreased mm. because it's come from folds of clothing mm. and then the same thing is just put. Mm. It could be soiled, it could be torn, it could be folded and all these variations have to be handled a lot more reliably because if the uh, paper gets jammed, then it's several days of outage before somebody can reach there. Right. So how many ATMs do you have on, uh, on the field now and uh, what are the targets that you've set for yourself? Well, we have about a thousand ATMs mm. so far mm. across all over India mm. and uh, we are looking to deploy another 3,000 this year and uh, probably 10,000 the year going forward. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, we, are, we are forecasting a very rapid growth, but this rapid growth is not something that only we will enjoy. It's a, uh, the entire industry has grown because we sort of demonstrated mm. the uh, model by which the reach could be significantly expanded. So actually India is the fastest growing ATM market in the world mm. and uh, we are going to have in the next three, four years, uh, two to three hundred thousand ATMs. Right. So let me come back to the point that you made earlier. You said that you wanted to address a problem of financial inclusion, right? And how to dispense money and that's how this idea was born. So what's the larger lesson in this in terms of approaching problems that we face at the bottom end uh, of the pyramid? And secondly, how does this in, uh, in some ways link to the larger challenges of manufacturing in India? Okay. Uh, see, the important thing is that we need to spend more time understanding the problem than probably we need to spend in finding the solution. Okay. So when we take a solution developed in some other context, then we are so obsessed with what the box that we have mm. that uh, we want to somehow make it fit, mm. round peg in a square hole. Mm. But instead if we were to look at a specific context and see what is really needed there and then build that ground up, uh, it is probably much easier sure. and also uh, much more aligned to the market we are seeking to address. Mm -hmm. And it will also be free from flab, you are not, you are not saddled with a whole lot of legacy mm. uh, features if you mm. can call them that, mm. which are not relevant mm. in the uh, particular market that you are trying to uh, right. satisfy. Right. So, and, um, and yeah. so this is the kind of thing that requires a unbiased and ground up approach, mm. uh, rather than looking over one's shoulder and seeing what somebody else is doing. How can I? And and that also it? you feel links to the larger manufacturing story in India. That means the yes. you know the real opportunity lies in finding such solutions and absolutely. building them. I mean, absolutely. For example, in, uh, if I look at manufacturing as a sector, mm. uh, there are a lot of things about how we do things in India, which uh, are very different from the way things are probably done in USA mm. or Germany or Japan. Mm. And for a country to um, grow and become strong, it has to be along the grain of where its strength is, mm. not against the grain. Mm. So uh, if we try to do something that is very orthogonal to our ethos, mm. then we will always be trying to imitate somebody and be a poor cousin uh, mm. of such a person. Mm. So for example, the way Japan picked up uh, in manufacturing a few decades ago was based on uh, 
uh, way of organizing which is very different from the way hmm. uh, things happen in the US. Hmm. And in India, it's a completely different paradigm. If you look at, for instance, the largest manufacturing sector in India is textiles, hmm. which is one of the areas I work in. Hmm. And um, uh, you will even see for something as intangible as IT, a hmm. lot of swank buildings. Hmm. But you would have never seen a large swank building saying that this is a textile factory. Hmm. <laughs> The textiles is organized as a large number of very small, tiny networked clusters mm. and uh, hardly catches your eye. Mm. But it's the largest employer after agriculture right. and it's one of the top uh, foreign exchange earners. It earns more foreign exchange than IT. Mm. And it's all done by people who are barely literate, very humble. Mm. And um, we need to recognize how mm. uh, the whole network ecosystem works mm. and build technologies that are aligned to it rather than trying to just plug in something got from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then that's how you're approaching the textile problem. So let me ask you a, a general question as we uh, come to a conclusion uh, of this chat. Uh, what are the kind of things that you're seeing today that you feel we should be thinking of solutions for? Well, uh, there are a lot of uh, big challenges mm. which when we drill down deep uh, can open up a number of opportunities. It's not so. The, actually, the large uh, number of challenges that we are facing, whether it's climate change, mm -hmm. whether it is killing of a large number of people, mm -hmm. whether it is uh, sustainability, environment, whole lot of things. Each of these uh, presents an opportunity for a large number of innovative solutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, a solution deserves to be called a solution only if it can actually take root in a particular environment and thrive. And uh, the way things work in India, what kind of things would succeed in India is very different. The soil is very different, mm. if I may say so. Mm. And uh, we have to actually have the confidence to say that we will go figure out our solutions and build them mm. rather than trying to, I'm not saying be insular and don't take things from elsewhere, mm. but the definition of the problem must be ours, not somebody else's. Right. Solution pieces, components can be got from anywhere. Right. And, and you feel that climate change and uh, sustainability are issues that you are personally focused on or, or these are things that Yeah, the one other thing I am importantly focusing on now is what is called the skill gap, hmm. um, which all of us are familiar with. India is the youngest country in the world, but most people have no employable skills. Hmm. So you could skill them and con convert this into a largest opportunity, what is called the demographic dividend or you could self-destruct as a society because you'll have the largest number of hungry unemployed people in the world. Mm. And um, so this is a context where we uh, started seeing why is it so difficult to crack and skilling by which I mean hands-on skills as opposed to mere textual knowledge mm. is a different ball game. Uh, you require laboratory, you require workshops, you require consumables, you require equipment, all of which costs a lot of money. And uh, if it's mere textual knowledge, information transmission, you have e-learning. Mm. But there is no e-learning for Very a hands-on skill. Yeah. And that's when we thought, why can't we build simulators mm. uh, which uh, can impart over uh, uh, as much as e-learning mm. as effectively, which means 80% to 80% mm. extent without needing consumables, without needing infrastructure, without requiring skilled trainers, mm. impart skills in a mass way so that it is very low cost, very affordable, because today we are only able to produce 2% of India's needs annually mm. in relation to the demand. And uh, we have to really think out of the box, think how you can bring down costs and other ob obstacles right. by one or two orders of magnitude. Right. Kanan, we've run out of time. Thank you so much sure. for speaking with us and wish you all the best with all your three ventures and Thank more you. to come. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much.